Okay, let's uh, go to God in prayer, and I want to get started. Father God, I just thank you for people who are concerned about your word, and I just pray, God, that you would help me as I teach today that I can communicate in a very effective way to all who are here. Just bless this lesson, Lord. Bless our nation. God, uh, uh, you've said that blessed uh, is the nation who honors you, and we're not honoring you, and that certainly will be very evident in, over these next couple of Lord's days together. So, honor the teaching, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Every Labor Day weekend, a growing number of self-proclaimed pagans journeyed to the Black Rock Desert in northwestern Nevada to rejoice in rebellion, revel in fleshly indulgences, and proudly preview their ultimate destination, hell. The festival is called the Burning Man. Now you've seen this on the news, it's been very prominent because they had a lot of rain which created a lot of mud which made it difficult for them to get out. But this is what we're talking about, what you saw on the news just a few weeks ago. So the festival is called the Burning Man so named because of the celebration's centerpiece, a towering 40-foot wooden faceless being erected in the middle of the pagan campground and burned on the final night. Although there is no official reason for torching the statue, some say it is done to raise the spirit of an ancient Indian mummy on <laughs> earth nearby. Since the mid-1980s, these pagan pilgrims have traveled out into the middle of nowhere in increasing numbers with this year's event attracting over 70,000 pagans. Wow. Many of those at the Burning Man once professed Christianity, but have turned their backs on God and his son, Jesus Christ. Several years ago, mission strategist George Ullis Jr., observed the festival incognito and wrote about it for Charisma magazine. What I'm going to share with you now, you have not heard on the news. Hmm. He described the revelry as post-apocalyptic and blasphemous. One individual told Otis, I'm fully prepared to shake hands with the devil as I stumble through the gates of hell. Another said, I certainly have no problem embracing the darkness. Let's celebrate the darkness. Let's honor it. I think that is a big part of Burning Man, giving the dark side of us the love and respect it deserves. The festivals end on Saturday night as the attendees observe and participate in a drama which celebrates the knowledge that they will all one day enter hell. Can you imagine no. having a festival? To celebrate, I'm going to hell and I'm happy about it. The crowd follows dramatic actors from one huge structure to another, simulating their descent into the abyss. Eventually, all arrive at what Otis calls a demonic sanctuary, described by its creatures as uh, creators, rather, as a found as a fountainhead of boundless rage, appalling shame and unenduring loneliness. Now, I just want to be lonely. <laughs> As the congregants make their way into the abyss, there are sounds of hellish music and the screeching of suffering souls along the images of evil spirits dancing, humans chained in eternal torment, a woman being devoured by Satan, demonic insects copulating with other captured souls. Towers are then set ablaze to join with the flames of Burning Man while the celebrants rejoice that souls have been captured and imprisoned for all eternity. Once Otis reflected on the festival, he said, I had to remind myself that, I, that what I witnessed was happening right here in the United States. Not in the temples of India, or the deserts of Sinai, I had to admit that the Christian values we have long cherished in the West are being extinguished. 
Hmm. Spiritual darkness has become more pronounced in our culture. We have stated, or we have started rather, we have started to see ungodly forces creeping into our own backyard. Mm -hmm. Now I want us to look at a passage from the book of Ephesians chapter 6. And it deals with the idea that we are surrounded by evil spirits and these evil spirits dwell in the atmosphere. And the Apostle Paul has warned us that we are in a spiritual battle and we are surrounded by demonic forces that are well organized. That is why he told the Ephesian brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this present age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. These demonic beings that dwell in the atmosphere are well organized as they fall into ranks. So this is something very significant I want you to grasp. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul describes this demonic organizational structure. There are principalities, and the Greek word there for principalities is referring to government, rule, and authority. That is to say, Satan has a demonic government with a cabinet of principalities that advises him on evil governmental decisions. Then there are powers, and that word for powers in the Greek refers to the strength of demons. These are demons that have such strength that they can have a stronghold or exercise dominion over territories and individuals. There are rulers of darkness, and the word for rulers here refers to the fact that these demons rule worldwide as they seek to bring about a world ruler or a world lord whom we know as the Antichrist. He will, during the Great Tribulation, rule over the entire earth and reign in the spirit of darkness and evil. And finally, there are the spiritual hosts of wickedness. And that word for hosts in the Greek refers to an army of evil spirits under the authority of Satan and his principalities. And they are committed to do all manner of wickedness. So let's get a picture now of what Paul is telling us. Let me put this all together for you. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And along with his demonic hosts dwell in the atmosphere. They're all around us. <coughs> Satan has set up a government to rule over the entire earth. He is the head and CEO of his cabinet called principalities. He has an army consisting of demonic beings that have great power, as well as rulers that control areas of the entire world. They are bent to do great wickedness on the earth and in the lives of individuals. And for this reason, Satan is called the god of this age or the god of this world. And he has blinded those who do not believe Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Now that is the power behind the burning man, as well as all the evil that we are witnessing today. We find ourselves in spiritual warfare, and we need to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We need to put on the whole armor of God, so we are able to stand against the wiles of the devil. This message, by the way, will end positively. But what we're going to hear between now and then is not good news. But I don't think I'm going to be sharing anything that you in this room are not aware of. I'm just going to tell you how it's being put together. Okay? Let's look at the paganization of the pre-Christian world. This, this is interesting right here. Because before the time of Christ and the establishment of the church, paganism with its thousands of gods and goddesses ruled over the earth. However, there were three principal gods that dominated, gods that go back to ancient Babylon and move forward from kingdom to kingdom. These gods look on various names 
or took on various names depending on the kingdom that was ruling at the time. In other words, as kingdom conquered kingdom conquered kingdom, you had different languages. So the same God just gets different names as it moves through one kingdom to another. Understand that? Okay. These gods took on various names depending on the kingdom that was ruling at the time. In the Old Testament times, these gods were known as Baal, Moloch, and Ashtoreth, who under the Greeks was most prominently known as Ishtar. In this lesson, we will refer to this goddess as Ishtar. Baal, Moloch, and Ishtar have become known as the dark, unholy trinity. What is important to understand about these gods that were worshipped by ancient Israel is the use of the Hebrew word for gods is Shedim, which refers to a spirit or entity. Significant now that you understand where we're going here. I'm going to make sure all of us do. So when we talk about a Shedim, that is, these idols were more than just wood or stone. They had behind them the power of evil spirits. Understand that? They're not just bowing to something that's wood or stone. There is a demonic power behind that stone or that piece of wood. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, Paul, in speaking about the need to flee from idolatry, told the church, when the Gentiles sacrifice to their gods, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. See, that's the whole concept of Shaddim. They sacrifice to demons, not just to a piece of wood or a piece of stone or whatever that would represent that God. Instead of Paul using the word shedim, he uses the Greek word diamonas, from where we get the word demons, referring to evil spirits. Now notice the conquest of Christianity over pagan gods. This is, this is significant now. When Christ came and established his church, and his apostles began to take the gospel throughout the then known world, over time, Christianity prevailed over these Pagan gods and goddesses. There were no more Baal, Moloch, or Ishtar worshippers, and their altars and temples became nothing but archaeological wonders. When our nation was founded in 1776, it was built on biblical principles and morality. We became a nation greatly blessed of God. And as the psalmist said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That's Yahweh. Then came the rebellious generation of the 1960s. And the morality of that time began to take a drastic turn away from God. And it has only progressed to be worse and worse to this present day. So we're going to take you back to the 1960s now. Notice the evil 1960s and the return of the gods. And by the gods, I mean the Shadim. I mean those gods that have behind it demonic power. Got me? Okay. From out of the 60s and 70s came the renewal of the occult and witchcraft, the acceptance of free love. You don't need to be married to shack up. Then came no fault divorce. This led to the rise of pornography, the use of psychedelic drugs, to the legalization of abortion on demand. This led to the legalization of gay marriage. And from there came Gay Pride Month and the LGBTQ agenda. This has led to the increase of sex trafficking and the rise of pedophilia, which has led to the acceptance of transgenderism as being perfectly normal for boys to become girls and for girls to become boys to the point that two genders, male and female, has become, well, maybe a hundred different genders, depending on who you talk to. And if you call a person other than their preferred gender, it could be a felony because it's a hate crime. This has all led to pulpits of the land teaching a woke Jesus and the furtherance of the apostate church. What I'm saying is, 
Liberal Protestantism today is falling right in line with the things that we're talking about right now. They're accepting the LGBTQ agenda. They're accepting the things that the Pride Month represents. And I'm going to tell you later on how the month of June became Pride Month. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you are in your senior years as I am, and I think that includes most of us here, I want you to look back over your life. Would you not agree that the evil in our nation has increased at least sevenfold since God has been removed from the public square? In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus tells this story of an unclean spirit going out of a man. This man has been totally delivered of the evil spirit. The spirit that left the man travels to a desert area to seek, the, to seek rest, but does not find it. Then the demon says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put in order. See, the demon had been exercised from this person. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the man is worse than the first, so also shall it be of this wicked generation. Jesus is talking about a generation that is seven times more wicked than it has ever been. There were times in our nation's history when evil and all manner of debauchery swept across this land. It was then that God raised up men like Jonathan Edwards and later Charles Finney, and two great spiritual awakenings brought revival to our nation. Yes, there was the Jesus revolution of young people that began in the latter 60s and early 70s. Paradoxically, it was at that same time when there was a counter movement to reject God. It was the beginning of a spiritual void of the land that has outlasted the Jesus revolution. There was the return of evil spirits, more wicked than before, and they filled the God void as sin and debauchery overran our nation. And now demonic spirits are seven times greater than before. What our nation faces is a demonic invasion that has resulted from a rebellion against God and his son, Jesus Christ. The only hope for our nation is another great spiritual awakening. And 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 is still a relevant verse for our day. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then... I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Messianic Jew, Jonathan Kahn. Uh, the idea for this uh, lesson actually comes from his book uh, entitled The Return of the Gods. Though much material is mine and the way I've organized it, but the whole concept comes from that book by Jonathan Kahn. So if you want to go into it uh, much deeper than what I can do in two weeks, or actually uh, next week's doesn't have anything to do with the book, uh, but that's a book you can pick up and read. Okay. So what I want us to do now is meet these gods. This unholy trinity, which consists of Baal, Moloch, and Ishtar. Who is Baal? It was the wicked Phoenician Queen Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal. Now notice the, the father of Jezebel. Jezebel is considered the most wicked woman in the Bible. Probably compared to Hillary Clinton. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. Maybe Pelosi thinks it. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. It was the wicked Phoenician Queen Jezebel. Notice her father's name is Ethbel, so that the God is in his name, see? He was king of Tyre and Sidon. Now, where's that located? That'd be modern-day Lebanon. And so she, Jezebel, became the wife of King Ahab of Israel. Remember now, Israel is the northern kingdom. 
The kingdom had split. We've talked all about this. The southern kingdom is due to the northern kingdom. Is Israel, remember that? Okay, so Ahab is the king of the northern kingdom called Israel. It was she, that is Jezebel, that first introduced Baal worship to the Israelites in the 9th century BC. To the nation of Israel, Baal was the embodiment of paganism and of all pagan gods. He was the epitome of all that was not Yahweh and all that made war against him. Baal was the other god, the substitute god, the instead of god. He was the god that Israel turned to when it turned away from the one true god. He was the god who separated Israel from god. He was the god who canceled out god. In later years, Baal was identified with the Greek god Zeus, head of the Greek pantheon. So remember, as you move from kingdom to kingdom, the name of the gods changed, but it's the same god, it's just under a different name. Baal, the first of the dark trinity, was known as the king of gods, or the lord of the earth. The name Baal means lord, or owner, and master. This was not only his title, but a description of his nature. In his mythologies, he battled other Canaanite gods to gain or regain lordship and authority. An ancient Baal epic reveals his ambition. Mighty Baal desired the kingship of the gods. I want to rule over all gods. I am the god of gods. That was the message of Baal, okay? Well, he would have it, and he would become the undisputed lord over Canaanite deities. Now notice, uh, there's an interesting story in 1 Kings dealing with the contest of the gods. I'm sure you've heard this story before, but we need to include it. If Jezebel had her way, Baal would become the undisputed Lord over Yahweh, the God of Israel. The first effect of her influence was the immediate establishment of Baal worship beginning at the court of King Ahab. At her table were 450 prophets of Baal and 400 of Ashtaroth, later known as Ishtar. <clears throat> While she and these prophets were enjoying their meal and Paying tribute to Baal, the prophets of Yahweh were slain by her order. So anybody who's talking about the true God, they're being murdered. It was then that God raised up the prophet Elijah to set up a contest of the gods. He asked the Israelites who were worshiping Baal and at the same time were paying homage to Yahweh. He says, this, how long will you falter between two opinions? If Yahweh, if, if, the, if the Lord is God, he's talking about Yahweh there. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered not a word. So understand, here is Jezebel introducing Baal worship. The Israelites were already worshiping Yahweh. Now what's happening is they're worshiping Yahweh and they're worshiping Baal. See? Same time. And that's why Elijah is saying to them, how long will you falter between two opinions? Fall one way or the other. Either worship Baal or worship Yahweh. What's it going to be? <clears throat> then Elijah asked the prophets of Baal to secure two bulls that were to be prepared for sacrifice on the altar. The God who would bring fire down from heaven and consume the sacrifice would be the true God. The prophets of Baal agreed and were first to cry out, the Baal to consume the sacrifice with fire. Their prayer was, Oh Baal, hear us! But there was no voice. They began to dance around the altar, calling to Baal. No response, no fire from Baal on the altar. Elijah began to mock them. Well, maybe, maybe Baal is meditating while sitting on the toilet. <laughs> or maybe he's busy. Or on a journey. Or perhaps he's sleeping and needs to be awakened. The prophets cried all the louder and cut themselves with knives until the blood gushed out of them. Hours passed and there was no response from Baal. Then Elijah said, it's my turn. 
You've had your opportunity long enough. Elijah made an altar of 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of Israel. He put wood on the stone, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood. He had four water pots of water poured over the sacrifice three different times until the water ran all around the altar. He also filled the trench with water. Then Elijah prayed, O oh Lord, hear me, that the people may know that you are the Lord God. You are Yahweh. And that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell from heaven and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all of the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Oh Lord, oh Yahweh, he is God. The Lord, he is God. But Jezebel was not a happy queen. And Elijah had to escape for his life. Now I want you to see the return of Baal to our country. When Christianity arrived, Baal vanished. But made his return to America in the 1960s. He came disguised as the God of apostasy. Jonathan Cobb refers to Baal as the God of cancel culture. Whoa. Cancel public prayer. Cancel posting the Ten Commandments. Cancel the Bible. Cancel worship services during COVID. His ultimate goal is to cancel out the one true God and everything and everyone who speaks out for the one true God. If you get rid of God, get this now, if you get rid of God, then everything becomes permissible. All morality comes from God and his word. Remove God and you have no morality. Everything's subjective. See? I can do what I want to do. But God has commandments of morality that we are supposed to live by. See, That is Satan's first scheme to win mankind away from God and unto himself. America is presently canceling out God to worship at the feet of Baal. This is the age we're living in right now. Well, next comes the second member of the unholy trinity, and that's Molech. And so we have to ask the question, who is Molech? If you don't know this, you're going to be shocked. Some have seen the spirit of Baal and the god Molech. Some say Molech is another name for Baal. Well, Molech was most likely under the influence of Baal because Molech... Uh, or because Baal, rather, was the god of all gods, yet he was the evil god of appeasement and child sacrifice. That is, Moloch is the evil god of appeasement and child sacrifice. What do I mean by the god of appeasement? Let's suppose you're having a lot of trouble in your life and things aren't going well and you feel what? The gods are all against me. So what do I have to do to get the gods on my side? That's where Molech comes in, because Molech is going to require that you sacrifice your youngest child. Molech had the head of a bull, just as did Baal, so they look similar in that regard. This brazen, beast-like god had outstretched arms and a large stomach ablaze with fire. When parents wanted the blessing of the gods, because things aren't going well, they would bring their youngest child, some as old as four, to the priest of Molech, who then would place the screaming child into the arms of Molech to be tossed into his fiery belt. Other priests stood by with blaring trumpets to drown out the screams of the mothers, as well as that of the children. Can you imagine a scene like that? The Levitical law given to Moses had strong prohibitions against Molech worship, and the passing of children through the fires. You see this in the book of Leviticus, the book of Deuteronomy, other places. Yet, King Solomon, under the influence of his pagan and adulterous wives, built high places for Chemosh, the Ammonite and Moabite named for Molech. Now, the Ammonites and the Moabites, they were neighbors of the Israelites, enemies of the Israelites. 
but they had this god called Chemosh, which was simply Molech. And so here's King Solomon. Remember, he marries all these pagan women. And so these pagan women that he's married to is, hey, you need to, you, you need to have, you need to have a, an altar for uh, Chemosh or Molech. In the book of Jeremiah, we find the passing of sons and daughters through the fires of Molech associated with the high places of Baal located in the valley of the son of Hinnom. It's very important you, you follow me now. Because this, this is going to be eye-opening to you if you've not heard me teach this before. And it's been a while since I have. Hinnom was a deep valley extending from the Kidron Valley on the east side of the old city of Jerusalem and curving toward the western side of the city. Outside the walls of Jerusalem, Molech was one of the chief idols to be set up in that valley and to which Israel fell prey. Now, this is what I want you to see. When altars were built to gods in those days, the altars were always built on top of mountains or high places, see? So you would go up to the mountains to sacrifice to the God whom you worshiped. But when it came to the fires of Molech, that was in a valley, not on a mountaintop. It was in the Valley of Hinnom. Where's the Valley of Hinnom? If you go to Israel, some of you are going there next year, you will see the Valley of Hinnom. It's outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. So outside the walls, you have this deep valley, and then it rises up into a hill, and the hill is called the Mount of Olives. So all of you are familiar with the Mount of Olives. Jesus did a lot of teaching on the Mount of Olives. So when you stand on top of the Mount of Olives, you are able to look into the city of Jerusalem, the old city, and you are able to see the valley of Hinnom, which separates the Mount of Olives from the old city. Got the picture? Okay. So, while there were altars to Molech on the hilltops, when it came to the assassination of children being burned to death in the belly of Molech that was in the valley of Hinnom okay now King Josiah of Judah he was a godly king he had all the pagan idols and temples destroyed which included <coughs> Molech and turned the valley of Hinnom into a garbage dump it's, it's very important you remember that now so the Valley of Hinnom now, a part of the Valley of Hinnom becomes a garbage dump for the city of Jerusalem. Yet after his death, after the death of Josiah, this gruesome practice was reinstated. Now notice, notice the altar of Molech now is located in hell. Here is truly the most significant irony about Hinnom. The Greek word is Gehenna. It comes from the word Hinnom and is translated hell 12 times in the New Testament. Jesus likened hell to a garbage dump. Well, it was. Filled with refuge, sewage, and where dead bodies were cast if one did not have sufficient money for a proper burial. Jesus said, in the day of judgment, all Christ-rejecting sinners will suffer eternally in Gehenna, along with the devil and his angels. Jesus warned the Pharisees about harming little children with their hypocritical lifestyle. Then he said this, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to Gehenna, to go to hell, into the fire, because... It was a garbage dump, and the fires are burning there, which shall never be quenched. It's where the worm does not die. You see, when people go to hell, their conscience, the worm, does not die. Remember when we studied the book of Isaiah, people who are deeply far from God were known as worms in the eyes of God. 
This is a place where the worm does not die. And the fire is not quenched, said Jesus, Mark chapter 9. He went on to say the same thing about cutting off your foot and plucking out your eye. If you don't dismember sin, you await the eternal fires of Gehenna where the worm does not die. This is the final judgment on all who reject Christ. There is a horrible irony in the sacrifice of children in the fires of Molech. One of the methods of abortion is for a probe to penetrate the uterus of a mother and burn the baby in her womb inside and out. There is also the method to bind and suffocate the child so it is born dead. Another method is to cut off the baby's head as the child in the womb moves about and screams to avoid decapitation. Once dead, its various body members are severed and piled on a table. Not a pleasant thing to talk about, but folks, that's what's happening today. Let's talk about the return of Moloch. Can you imagine now, when the Supreme Court legalized abortion in 1973, resulting in the murdering of nearly 70 million babies? That is, one out of every three pregnancies. It was in that year that when Roe versus Wade legalized abortion as our nation welcomed the return of the god Moloch. 1973, Moloch came to America. And even though Roe versus Wade was recently overturned by the Supreme Court and sent back to the states to determine its legality, listen, abortion is still legal in this country. State of California, it's legal here. In fact, our governor is inviting people, hey, come on over. Do you live in a state that doesn't want abortion? Come on over, we'll pay your way. We've got an evil, evil governor. governor. Through the practice of abortion, this evil practice, Moloch has returned to become the god of the pro-choice, pro-abortion, Planned Parenthood movement in this country. As God's judgment was on ancient Israel for its worship of Moloch and child sacrifice, so the judgment of God has fallen on our nation as well. Now, let's see what God's word has to say about abortion. This is not a whole lesson on abortion. We could talk a lot more about it as we've spent many a class doing so. But here's what I want you to see. God's word is clear that life begins at conception. God, through the cooperation of the father and the mother, causes the 23 chromosomes from the father to unite with the 23 chromosomes of the mother, creating life in the womb of the mother. This is the miracle work of God, the creation of a human baby. You think about the male sperm. There are three there are, what, 300 million, 300 million sperms that come from that male that unite with the egg of the woman that is the size of a period at the end of a sentence. <laughs> Every one of you in this room began the size of a period. But you see, one of the 300 million sperms outraced all the others to get to that egg. Why do you think we men like sex so much, eh? We're in a race. <laughs> and that's why you're here. That's why you're here. And it's God who put this together in the womb of the mother. That's what the Bible says over and over again. I, I don't have time to give you all the verses, but I've given you just some there. Now, since God created a living baby in the womb of the mother, then anyone who kills that baby is guilty of murder in the eyes of God. Let me give you the strongest passage of Scripture to support my case. When Moses received the law of God at Mount Sinai, 
He received instruction from God concerning the unborn child. I'm reading now from Exodus chapter 21, beginning of verse 22. If men fight, so we have a fist fight going on, and hurt a woman with child, let's say this pregnant woman now is coming over to break up a fist fight between two men. Got the picture? Yeah. So she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows. You see, what, what happened was that one of the men accidentally hit the woman in the womb right where the baby is, and the baby now is born prematurely. Yet no harm follows. He shall surely be punished according to the woman's husband, uh, as the woman's husband imposes on him. And he shall pay as the judges determine. So, here my wife, you know, she's just been she's pregnant. She's just been hit by a man in the, in the womb. The baby's been delivered, but the baby is okay. No harm has been done to the baby. No harm has been done to the mother. So, the father, on the other hand, has a right to take that man to court and sue him for hitting his pregnant wife, but that's the extent of it. There's, an agree, there's a payment that has to be made. Now, let's go on. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, strike for strike. Notice that. Whatever harm has been done to the baby, that harm is to be inflicted on the person who threw the punch in a fight that accidentally hit the womb of the pregnant woman. If the baby is delivered dead, then the one who hit the mother is to be put to death. It is a capital offense. Understand that? In ancient Israel, the unborn baby is the most protected member of society. Now, I, 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 I chose, I don't know why I didn't add this to the notes, that are, maybe it's because they're long enough, but I'll, I'll just extend on this, because you might find this interesting. Let's, let's say that the baby, here, here's, a, here's the fight, fist fight going on, here's the pregnant lady, she's coming over to break up the fist fight, and she gets hit in the womb, and she dies, and it's all accidental. It's accidental. See? The man did not intend to kill her at all. She just got in the way of his fist. But the baby is born, and there's no harm to the baby, but the mother dies. Now, the man who accidentally killed that woman can flee to a city of refuge. There were 48 cities of refuge. And there he would present his case to the elders of the city. And if the elders of the city thought, hey, this is an accidental thing, he was under house arrest, but he was not put to death. He could remain in that city. He was not to go outside that city. If he did, <coughs> then he was leaving himself open for revenge from the members of the family that were out to kill him because this woman was killed. Mm -hmm. But as long as it remained in the city, he was protected until the high priest died. Then he was free. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what we've just said now? That if the baby, if the baby was killed, then the man who hit the woman, even though it was accidental, is to be killed. Mm -hmm. If the mother is killed, he can still live. That was the law. If the baby lived and the mother died, that was the baby lived and the mother yeah. died. Yeah, and the mother died, yes. So, what you can see is in ancient Israel, this is the point. In ancient Israel, the unborn baby is the most protected member of society. In America today, Moloch has returned and our lawgivers who support abortion and our gynecologists who perform abortions are all guilty of murder. Well, next comes the third member of the dark, unholy trinity, Ishtar. I want to say next week's lesson is all about Ishtar. 
So I'm going to give you a little introduction, and uh, we're going to compare Barbie, the movie Barbie, and the doll Barbie as kind of a reincarnation of Ishtar. But that's next week. That's next week. So bring your dish, we're going to have good food, then we're going to throw it up. Okay, yeah. Okay, who is Ishtar? The goddess Ishtar went by many different names. To the Canaanites, who had great influence over Israel, her name was Asherah. In biblical times, she was often connected with Baal and appears as his lover or sexual consort. The Semonite world called her Astarte. The Sumeranians called her Ayana. In the Greek world, she was Aphrodite, and to the Romans, the goddess Venus. But to the Assyrians and Neo-Babylonians, when we talk about Neo-Babylonians, we're talking about the Babylonians of the days of Nebuchadnezzar and beyond, see? Not Babylon and Nimrod. We're talking about Neo-Babylonians. And much of the Mesopotamian world, that's where she gets the name Ishtar. And that is the name she is best known by. Now notice she's the goddess of prostitution and sexual immorality. Ishtar was the goddess of prostitution, and in the Greek text of the Bible, the word for prostitute is pornea, from where we get the word pornography. The word pornography means the writings of the goddesses. Prostitution and pornography are all designed by demonic powers from the goddess Ishtar, and they are intended to destroy marriage. In the ancient world, there were images of naked women made of clay and pornographic literature which sexualized the culture, and it all began with Ishtar. We live in a time where we have the sexualization of society. The word we use to speak of this sexualization is erotic. It comes from the Greek eros. Remember, a few weeks ago, I gave you the four different Greek words for love. And one of those words was eros. Okay. So, eros referred to sexual love. It had a good meaning to start with because it referred to the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. However, over time, it became associated with pornography. In Greek mythology, you have eros, a goddess, was born a child of Aphrodite, and that would be the Greek incarnation of Ishtar. So the goddess Eros was the god of sexual desires and love with the intent of arousing men to leave their wives for other lovers. Ishtar was not only the goddess of prostitution, she was the goddess of cross-dressing. She was seen sometimes turning herself into a male figure. The women would dress as men when they came to her temples to worship. She was also seen as female. So when men came to worship her, they dressed in female clothing. <clears throat> she was also the goddess of transgenderism, as she would change her gender at will. An ancient Mesopotamian writing records her as saying, Though I am a woman, get this now, Though I am a woman, I am a noble young man. Prostitution, pornography, homosexuality, cross-dressing, and the transgenderism is as old as human history. Don't think that what's going on today is something new. Remember Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. But there was a time in this nation of ours when all of these practices were viewed as immoral, taboo, and those who got involved in such erotica were seen as having psychological problems. Mentally, they simply were not there. Then we have the return of the goddess Ishtar in the 1960s, and quite suddenly all of these sins became normal behavior. The effect of her return began the sexual revolution in this country. This revolution included more than sex, more than mind-altering drugs, hard rock, demonic music, 
the revival of the occult and witches and Satan worship. It's where the burning man came from. Marriage was considered old fashioned. The nuclear family is obsolete. Men were feminized and women were emasculated. It was all seen as the new morality. What you're going to find now is extremely interesting. If the rest of it hasn't been, <laughs> I hope it has. Kept your attention. It's called the Stonewall, the Night of the Goddess. The story is in Jonathan Kahn's book. That's where I got it, and, and you need to understand it. There was one single event that would embody Ishtar's entrance into modern culture in a way that no other event ever had. More than any other event, this one would open the door for the altar of morality in our nation. It was what was known as the Stonewall Riot at the Stonewall Inn, a gay bar of Greenwich Village in New York City. It was owned and operated by the Mafia. In late June of 1969, the police raided it. It was a bar where homosexual acts were out in the open, though not legal at the time, but it also operated without a proper liquor license. The raid began in the early hours of the night. There was an estimated 200 people at the bar that night. During the raid, the police cleared most of them out and focused their efforts on the bar's employees and a number of cross-dressers who they pressed for identification. Soon they began loading some of those they had kept for questioning into a police van. The multitude of patrons remained outside, along with curious onlookers. During one of the arrests, someone took hold of the crowd, an agitation, then a spirit of rage, and then an explosion. The crowd started taunting the police, hurling objects at them, bottles, rocks, and reportedly bricks. The rage was so fierce and the situation so dangerous that the police retreated into the bar, barricading themselves in fear of their lives. The crowd then came after them, charging the bar, attempting to break open its front door to get them. Eventually, help came from the barricaded police, but the rage of the uprising went on. The Stonewall riots continued for days. At the time, it appeared an oddity, a disturbance on the fringe of society. Most people had no idea it ever happened. But the repercussions of that, of what happened that night, would grow and deepen with the passing of time. What eventually came out of Stonewall? The arrival of the goddess Ishtar. She was always associated with a gate. When Nebuchadnezzar built the city of Babylon, the main entrance to that city was called Ishtar's Gate. Remember, these gods go all the way back to Nebuchadnezzar and Neo Babylon. America had one gateway above all others through which millions entered and departed and through which trade and commerce passed that gate we are referring to as New York City, with its Statue of Liberty holding a lamp lifted beside the golden door. It was then that the goddess Ishtar entered that gate, and when she did, Pride Month was initiated. <coughs> Why is June Pride Month. You remember this past year. We couldn't get enough. We, we, no, we got too much. They didn't think we got enough. We just got, yeah. I mean, I'm walking out the street. I see gay flags hanging up, you know, all of that. All of the push for the whole month of June because it was gay pride. Mm -hmm. The first gay parade was held in New York City, June the 28th, 1970. On the one year anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, this inaugurated Pride Month, which is celebrated every June, the whole sexual revolution celebrating gay, lesbian, and transgender pride is held every June in our nation. Ishtar entered our nation in 1970 in the Stonewall Riots, and now our nation gives an entire month to Ishtar's presence at a gay bar known as Stonewall Inn. Isn't it ironic 
that our nation gives one day to celebrate its birthday on July the 4th, 1776. We give one day to remember our veterans in May of each year. We give one day to thank God for all of his blessings on our nation each November called Thanksgiving. We give one day to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ each December 25th. We give one day each spring to celebrate his resurrection from the grave, which we call Easter. Now notice this. Named after the goddess Ishtar. Where does the name Easter come from? It's, it's Ishtar. Easter has been paganized. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has been paganized. That's why you have all these rabbits, all these Easter eggs. See? You've got to populate. No one, okay, anyway. I'm just saying the name Easter comes from Ishtar. That's what we're saying here. <coughs> so we give an entire month for people to celebrate what God refers to as an abomination. When Baal returned, he began canceling out God. When God was sufficiently removed, Moloch entered the scene and begins aborting our babies. When Ishtar returned, she started the sexual revolution, which has canceled out all morality as taught in God's word. This is the return of the gods, an evil and unholy trinity that is paganizing our nation. Listen, God help us. Yeah. Understand how all of this is coming down? Okay, I need to wrap this up. We'll do it quickly. What do we do when surrounded by evil spirits? This is a message long on information and short on application. <clears throat> Paul has reminded us that we are surrounded by demonic powers that dwell in the atmosphere. They are very well organized under the headship of Satan. We talked about this at the beginning. Every believer has to contend with the attacks of spiritual forces which are fighting against God. Paul speaks of being a good soldier for Christ in your defense against the enemy. He tells you to be strong and to put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. So let's just briefly look at this weaponry that we have to put on, the weaponry for spiritual survival. Paul tells you to gird your waist with the belt of truth. That is, know what you believe and be able to defend the truth of God's word. Then, he says, put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect the heart or center of your emotions. When a man's heart is protected and he is clothed in righteousness, he is impregnable. When put, then, then he says, put on sandals. So you are equipped and ready to move. The sign of a real Christian is that you are eager to share the gospel. Then, he says, take hold of the shield, which Paul refers to as the shield of faith, by which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. One of the most dangerous weapons of ancient warfare was a dart tipped with tau, that is, unclean flax or wool that was dipped in pitch, or a type of black tile. The pitch soaked towel was set ablaze, and the dark was thrown. But the great oblong shield was the very weapon that punched it. So Paul is saying you always need to be holding up the shield of faith, for faith can deal with the darts of temptation. True faith is always complete with perfect trust in Christ. That means the closer you walk with Christ, the safer you are from being burned by the devil. Then you are to put on the helmet of salvation, meaning you must always keep in your mind who you are. You are a child of God. You are forgiven. You have been justified. You have been sanctified. You are saved. Such knowledge will keep you motivated in your struggle against the evil one. And then there's the sword which Paul calls the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God's Word is at once your weapon of defense and of attack. It is a weapon for defense against sin and your weapon of attack to fight the sins of the world. It was said that the English military leader Oliver Cromwell led his troops 
this British general, known as Ironsides. That was his troops, the Ironsides. He led them to battle with a sword in one hand and the Bible in the other. Wow. We can never defeat God's enemies or win God's battles without God's book. And finally, Paul speaks about the greatest weapon of all, the weapon of prayer. He says, you are able, he says, you are to pray always. It must be intense and it must not be selfish as you are to pray for all the saints. Listen, Satan is real. He's alive and active. <clears throat> You must always be prepared for battle. As a nation, we are founded on godly principles from God's holy book. But beginning in the 1960s, we became a nation who has rebelled against God. This has resulted in the return of the gods. Baal, the god of cancellation, who desires to cancel out the one true God. Moloch, the god of child sacrifice and abortion. And Ishtar, the goddess of the sexual transgender revolution. But I want you to see this. In the end, we Christians win. That's the pause. That's the, that's the best news. But I'm going to share that. This is the best news of the whole lesson. It only take me one minute to say it. Let us never forget. In the end, we Christians are the overcomers and the true winners in this spiritual battle. The day will come when at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. That's the people who are dead, but they're still alive. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Listen, this includes all Baal, Moloch, and Ishtar worshippers. Sadly, for them it is too late. The fires of Gehenna are burning. But for us believers, we have already confessed his name and our eternal destination is with the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.